uh, blessings to you, and we're going to open the scripture today, and I know you guys are hungry for the word, and you're fed well here, so uh, we are going to, uh, if you will open first to Luke 17, and uh, you can mark Luke 17, and we're going to read uh, a passage, a short passage out of Revelation 12 on our way to Luke 17. You know, um, some people notice the greatness of God when they're looking at the mountains or looking at the ocean or they're seeing the grandeur of creation. And amen to that. I see the greatness of God there. But one of the places that I see the greatness of God is, is that in eight plus billion people on the planet that he is aware of my heart and he's aware of your heart and he hears your words and he hears your prayer and if your heart ever becomes wayward that he'll step in gently and say hey this is not the best place for you to go and then we can turn our heart repentance simply means coming into alignment with God, agreeing with God. And he's aware. He keeps, us, he keeps us holy. Isn't it kind of God to do that? And that eight plus billion people, and he knows them all. He knows you. He knows your name. He knows what you're struggling with today. We had such a sweet time of prayer with Edgar and Anna this morning uh, during worship. And... Uh, they asked me how they could pray for me, and uh, I'm being gossiped about right now. I'm being, I'm being spoken of untruly and unfairly and maliciously right now. It's hard. And, um, and my flesh wants to lash out. And you know the Lord has a better way, right? The Lord has a better way. And... And I want to show you where all this comes from in Revelation 12. And we're going to pick it up in verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, he's, this is a title for the devil, okay? For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them, now watch this, before our God day and night has been hurled down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So I've been, I've been thinking about how I can overcome the enemy. Now, now, if he's called the accuser, we need, to, we need to understand how he operates. And here's how he operates. He accuses you to God, God to you, you to others, others to you, and you to yourself. And how often does he do it? Day and night. That's what he says Right here, day and night, but he's been hurled down. But he still accuses. But here's, notice what John says here about us. That we overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So, so let me... Hear me out as I say something strong here. Okay? In terms of overcoming the enemy, the word of your testimony is exactly as strong as the blood of Christ. Okay? Not for salvation. Your salvation comes only because of Christ. But you can live as miserably as you want to. If you want to overcome the enemy, the blood of Christ is enough to do that. 
But you've got to come into agreement with the blood of Christ. Okay? So, so that right there is the way all spiritual authority is established. Is by agreement. And so if you agree with God, the protection of the authority of God overshadows you. But if you agree with the enemy, which is most of the time what your flesh wants to do, then the authority of the enemy overshadows you. Does this make sense? Okay, so, so when we get accused, it is a very, very tricky place to stand because your flesh wants to accuse back. But if we come into agreement with the enemy, listen, the, the enemy is condemned. So we, if we agree with him, we come under the shadow of condemnation. Do you see that? If we, if we disagree with him, we come out from under condemnation and into agreement with redemption. The word of God. Is this making sense? So, so when we're accused of something, it is a very, very tricky place to stand. Because often everything inside of you wants to protect and defend and accuse back. And God goes, hold on now, hold on, hold on. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Because to overcome the enemy... The blood of Christ has done its work. Will I agree with the blood of Christ or will I disagree? An accusation is a very, very difficult thing for us. He, he dwells in the realm of accusation because he is... And his goal is to, is to come at you... And just get you to give just a little bit of room for the accusation. Just give it just a little room. And how many of you know that there's often an ounce of truth in an accusation? Okay? If, if you've got a 55-gallon barrel of drum full of water and five drops of cyanide, do you want to drink that? I mean, it's all—it's 99% pure. You wouldn't you drink that? It'll kill you. But that's, that's what an accusation is. And so what he's doing is he's coming at you saying, just give it just a little bit of room here. But the moment we do, we come into alignment with condemnation. Okay, so if somebody comes to you and says, you know that Marcus... Let me just tell you about that, Marcus. And you go, oh, wow, huh? I, I had no idea about that, about him. So what you've done now is, is you, have, you have separated relationship from me, and whatever I'm available to offer to you, you're going to reject. You see that? And so that's, that's what accusation comes, is it, it comes to separate relationship. And so anytime we see a separation of relationship, there is always, always, always an accusation. And it results in broken relationships. And you know what? Most of us have never been taught how to handle broken relationships. I was, I was talking to Pastor Scott just this morning about, about, you know, I thought that I would be better at this by now, about handling an accusation. And I think, I think we don't get enough repetitions. Praise the Lord. You know, I don't, want it, I don't want it to happen every day enough that I get good at it, you know? But when it happens, I feel a little bit ill-equipped. I got I to gotta go back to the Word. I got to go back to the Lord and say, okay, now walk me through this. 
one more time. But l- let me say this about, about a person who accuses. I have learned to have mercy on them because I know what they live under. They live under condemnation. And they're simply giving away what they have. And it's hard for me to watch a person who has nothing better to give than an accusation. And so today I want us to look to Jesus. If you'd flip over there to Luke 17, I want us to look to Jesus and find out how do we deal with people. And and I'm praying today that nobody's asking the Lord how to deal with me. Okay? And Jesus is going to speak into that for you and me today. So when we get to Luke 17, so, so Jesus, at Luke 17, he's about six months away from the cross. Okay? So his ministry on the earth was about three and a half years. He's been at this for about three years. And now everywhere he goes, he can't go into a house, can't go into a building. He's got, scholars estimate, thirty to 50,000 people following him around. But, but as the crowds increase, his focus narrows. And by this point in Luke's gospel, he's speaking to three groups of, of people almost specifically. He's speaking to apostles, and there's 12. He's speaking to disciples, and it's the front row folks. It's the folks most devoted to him. Probably 50 to 100. And he's speaking to the Pharisees. He's speaking to the Pharisees. And often what he's doing when he speaks to the Pharisees is he is is singling out a way of relating to God that's different than his way. And the way the Pharisees related to God was through pride. Okay, he's going to talk in just a second about you, you increase your phylacteries. That was the box on their forehead where they put the scriptures in and they walked around and they, they got them bigger and bigger and bigger. Think gold suits here today. Okay, they increased the, the length of their tassels on their prayer. They had these prayer shawls and at the end of the prayer shawl, they would have tassels and they kept getting them a little longer and a little longer and a little longer. And he said, you, 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 wanted the, you wanted the chief seats at the, at the banquet. So they'd be invited to dinner and they'd walk right up to the front and sit down and cross their legs and say, anybody need wisdom? I'm here. I'm here for you. And everybody's going, ugh, who are these people? And so Jesus starts speaking to the Pharisees and he's trying to help folks like you and me understand, here's what's wrong with that. I don't hate them. I hate the way they come to God. Because they're better than everybody. They're they're important. They think God's impressed because their tassels are long and their boxes are big and they're sitting at the front of the table. They walk around through the crowded streets of Jerusalem and they say, call me rabbi. Jesus says, no, no, no. That's not how I relate to people. So if you, if you page through Luke about 15 on, you're going to start seeing him develop a habit. And he goes, almost Pharisees, disciples, apostles, disciples, Pharisees, apostles. And here's what we find in Luke 17. That he turns to his disciples in verse 1 and he says, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come. But woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a a millstone weighs a ton, y'all. 2,000 pounds. Into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. 
If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said, Whew, we're going to need more faith for that. <laughs> and he replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted, planted in the sea, and it'll obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down and eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper? Get yourself ready. Wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, should say, we're unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So let me walk through this little text with you. And I want to point out, Four things that Jesus said to help us get along with people. Okay, I need this today. Preaching to me first. Okay. The first one is, don't, of, don't be offensive. Don't be offensive. You see it mostly on social media. I wonder why people say things to others on social media that they would never say to someone's face. Isn't that an odd thing? I guess there's protection behind a screen, distance. But, but it applies. Jesus said, don't be offensive. Verse 1 says, it's inevitable that stumbling blocks will come, but woe to those through whom they come. I don't want to be one that Jesus says, woe to you. He said that to the Pharisees. But I, I want to call your attention to a very delicate balance here, okay? Because, because on the one hand, if we, if we become a people that just, I just have to make everyone happy. Is everyone happy? Anyone not happy? I want to come make you happy. I don't want to, I don't want to ever do anything that might upset you. If, if there's anything that I can do to make sure that nobody's upset. You see how awful that is? Let me just tell you something. If you love the truth, it's just a matter of time until someone is offended at you. Okay? That is not being offensive. Now, okay, now you realize Jesus was never offensive. But a lot of people got offended at him. Do you see that, how delicate this balance is? So we've got to be people that love the truth and yet we don't become offensive with the truth. It's, it, can, it can be hard to do. I mean, let, so let me, get, let me give you a couple examples. When, when Lexa and I got married, I played golf too much. I had, a, I had a very low handicap, but I played way too much. And so we got married and she goes, honey, you play too much golf. And you know what? She was right. But I got offended. She wasn't being offensive. But I wanted what I wanted. I wanted my cake and eat it too. And I couldn't have it. And so I went to prayer and the Lord said, she's right. Well, not the first time in our marriage that that happened. Okay? But I wound up putting my golf clubs in the closet. And our marriage got a whole lot better. But it was right for her to call me out on that. Um, years ago at one of our campuses, we had a, we had a guy that was uh, part of our church, a, a, just a great guy. He was a, a truck driver, north of 300 pounds, wore overalls and combat boots. And he had been so deeply touched by the Lord that you couldn't get around him for, for 60 seconds without, without understanding, whoo, God did a work on this guy. And it was, it was awesome. 
But he would come to church early. He would park on the front row. He would enter into worship. And he would enter into to intercession before the church service started. And by the time service started, this is the way we all ought to be, by the way. By the time the service started, his worship was already increasing. Nobody had to call him to worship. I mean, he was there before anybody else started. He was, he was number one. Okay? But about five or six minutes in, he would get so touched by the Lord that he got to jumping up and down. He would walk the altar back and forth, and he would be claiming the promises of God. And I noticed that about five or six rows back, the worship subdued because his presence was so strong. And it became consistent. And so I went to him one day. I said, hey, I love you. Can we have a conversation? He said, sure. I said, man, it's obvious how much the Lord's touched you. And I said, you would never want to do anything to take attention away from the Lord and put it on yourself. He said, no, I wouldn't. And I said, are you aware that that's what's happening? And he said, no. I said, can we work together? He said, yes. Let's take care of this. And so we worked on it, and, and, and we fixed the problem together. But I, was, I wasn't offensive. But I had to, I had to guard over the, the congregation. This was my calling. Okay? So, so he and I together fixed that problem. And, and it was, I, I honor him to this day. We're still, we're still friends. And, and there, but there's a, there's a way to carry out the word of the Lord that is kind. I could have gone to him and, I, and said, stop it. You, you, you are getting all the attention off of God and you just need to calm down. Okay? But how wrong would that have been? Okay, so, so there's, a, there's a way to say it. There, there's a thing to be said, and then there's a way to say it. And what Jesus is saying here is, don't be offensive. You don't have to be offensive. Here's the second thing. Is, he says, be ready to forgive. Be ready to forgive. Now, I want, I want you to notice, verse, uh, let's pick it up in verse 3. He said, so watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back and says, I repent, then forgive him. And all this is, is, is a follow-up to what he said about it's impossible that, offense don't come, that, that offenses don't come. Meaning, I promise you're going to have opportunity to be offended. One translation puts it this way. Temptations to sin. It, it's, it's impossible that temptations to sin don't come. Isn't that an odd translation? But, but here's what he's saying. Every time you're offended, it's a temptation for you to sin. So just know that. If there's ever anything in your heart that says, that doesn't sit right with me. There's a temptation there that's trying to draw you in to sin. What offends you? What if I, I want to become unoffendable. I want to be a person that lives before God and I am not available for offense. But I am so far from that. Let me tell you, let me tell you what offends me. So, so, I have a travel job. I don't travel a lot, but I travel some. And, and because I travel a lot, I recently got upgraded to first class. I was like, whoa, I'm not used to this. So I get on the plane with my bag. I find my seat near the front of the plane. Hallelujah. And right above my seat is a bin, and there's a bag in it. 
Okay, every seat has a bin above it for the bag of the person sitting in that seat. Somebody put their bag in the bin above my seat. You see how mature I am here. I'm offended. Okay, I'm, I'm riding first class and ticked about it. So we land, and, we, and this is a large airport where you've got to ride a bus for a long way to get to your rental car. So the bus makes stops about every 100 feet, it seems. And every time the bus stops, more people get on. So I'm sitting there, and the bus, now every seat's taken. We stop again, and more people get on, and there's, there's a woman that gets on. So I stand up and say, please have my seat. Men, if you don't know this is a thing, don't sit while a woman stands, okay? This is a thing, okay? It's called being a gentleman. And so we stop again, and a very old woman gets on the bus. And right down the row are four very strong college-age men who don't get up and let the old woman sit. And I got offended again. <laughs> See how mature I am? I'm just getting offended all day long here. So that's what Jesus means when he says, it is impossible that you not be offended. I, got, I bumped into a, an old friend recently, and he talked to me about another friend of ours that we both have. And he told me how successful this guy, how, how prosperous his business had become. Well, this guy betrayed me. I don't want him to prosper. God, what are you prospering this guy for? I got offended. See how mature I am? So I'm, I'm petty. But it is impossible for life circumstances to not offend you. And so there was a whole brand of Christianity back in the Middle Ages called Stoicism. Okay, and the Stoics were people that just learned how to get through life without responding to any of it. Good, bad, they're not going to laugh, they're not going to cry, they're just, just stone-faced, Stoic. Okay? The gospel doesn't come to make us less human. The gospel comes to make us more human. And so as followers of Jesus, we experience a full range of disappointments. Emotions common to all people. But how do we respond? Let me just say, we, we charismatics love to talk about the Holy Spirit. And when we talk about the fullness of the Holy Spirit, most often the time, we're talking about healing, prophecy, tongues, interpretation. Stuff you can't do without God, right? Can I cannot just tell you that if you stop being offensive and you learn how to forgive quickly, you will never be more full of the Holy Ghost than you will be in that moment. That is the fullness of God. I've got, a, I've got a Samson theory. Man, I'm running out of time. Let me, get, let me give you my Samson theory right quick. Everybody thinks Samson was, was 6'10", 350 pounds, and looked like Arnold. <laughs> but that guy rips gates off of a city. Everybody goes, look at him. I think Samson was five six and a buck twenty five. Skinny, no definition. This is who Samson was. Because if that guy ripped the gates off of a city wall, everybody goes, "Lord, God is on him." Right? That's my that's my Samson theory. So, let me give you four reasons we overlook an offense. One is your honor. Proverbs 19.11 says it is to a man's honor to overlook an offense. 
Number two is your own sin. Luke 6, 42 says, How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you, call, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye. Ouch. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Number three is your growth. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is spiritual growth. And number four is your forgiveness. Luke 6.37 says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. All right? So here's the third thing is to recognize your own weakness. And here's what I mean by that. They said, in response to, don't be offensive and be ready to forgive, they said, we're going to need more faith. And they were exactly right. Because you can't do this without faith. They had watched him heal. They had watched him preach. They would watched him gather people. But when he calls them to forgive quickly, they said, this is going to take some work. This is going to take a leap. Because we stink at this. God, we're going to need more faith. And he goes, uh, you're exactly right. But let me tell you how faith works. And this is what Jesus says. If you got faith like a mustard seed, listen, you can hold 50 mustard seeds in the palm of your hand. And yet the tree that grows from a mustard seed is disproportionate to the size of the seed. Do you hear what Jesus is saying here? The, the, the mustard tree can be 40 feet tall and 40 feet wide and so full you can't see the birds in it. And yet you can hold 50 seeds in the palm of your hand. Here's, here's what he's saying. If you'll not be offensive and you'll forgive quickly, the fruit that grows from that will be disproportionate to the energy and faith it took for you to do it. Does this communicate? Je Jesus was a, a master communicator. And then he says, he says this, this, if you'll do this now, you can say to the, to the mulberry tree, be thrown into the sea. Have you ever seen anybody throw a mulberry tree into the sea? I've seen people try that. And then they beat themselves up for not having any faith. Okay, this is not what Jesus is saying here. If you spoke to a mulberry tree and said, mulberry tree, be cast into the sea, and it happened, everybody around you would say, wow, that's the power of God we just saw. And if you forgive quickly, everybody around you will say, we just saw the power of God on him. That's what Jesus is saying. The fourth thing he says is to reject honor as unworthy servants. And you can, you can read through that to the end if you want to. I'm out of time, but here, here's what Jesus is saying. Look, if you, if you learn how to be non-offensive and quick to forgive, it doesn't make you a hero. You could stand up and say, yeah, let me tell you all what I've done. Let me tell you about the offense that I forgave. And God goes, you're just doing what I told you to do. This is not extra credit here. Okay? This is, this is fundamental, foundational, children of God stuff. But if you'll do it, the power of God will so rest on your life that the fruit that results would be dis disproportionate to what it took for you to do it. That's what he's saying here. And so this is the kind of person that Jesus is calling us to be. Okay? So I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I want you to think right now, about the opportunities 
the opportunities in your life right now that you have, not somebody else, that you have to be offended? What have people said about you? And so now we've got a fork in the road. And we can either decide we're going to go the way of the flesh, we're going to seek revenge, or we're going to say, God, I need the power of God to come now in Jesus' name and rest on me because I am not strong enough to do this without you. God, I need your grace to come right now. And the moment that you, that you meet that fork in the road, and listen, if you've already begun down the road of revenge, repentance says, I'm going to come into agreement with God. And that's all you have to do is say, God, I repent. I want to agree with you. I want, I want the shadow of your authority to, to, to cast over me. Now, here's what the Lord is calling you to right now. Today, you're going to do the right thing. You're going to do the right thing. In this moment, it's hard to say, I just have to let him go. Yes. Actually, you're going to let him go to God. But for you, you're not going to speak offensively, and you're going to be quick to forgive. So God, thank you today. Thank you that, that we are becoming acquainted with the power of God that redeems broken relationships. God, we're asking you that you would make your presence known in our lives today. God, thank you for opening your word and your heart to us today. In Jesus' name.